Okay, so good day everyone. So for today, we will discuss about the capillary puncture equipments and procedures. So this is a very this is a very long lecture. So please bear with me. So drops of blood for testing can be obtained by puncturing or making an incision in the capillary bed in the dermal layer of the skin using a lancet or any other sharp device or a laser. So capillary specimen collection is especially useful for pediatric patients in whom removal of larger quantities of blood can have a serious consequences and it can also be difficult So first, we have the capillary puncture equipments. We have the lancets or the incision devices. So a lancet is a sterile, disposable, sharp, pointed, or bladed instrument that either punctures or makes an incision in the skin to obtain capillary blood specimens for testing. So they are available in a range of lengths and depths to accommodate various specimen collection requirements. So selection depends on the age of the patient, the collection site, volume of the specimen required, and the puncture depth needed to collect an adequate specimen without injuring the bone. Because your fingers, it's a very thin layer of dermis, of the skin, and then you already have the bone. So you have to find a depth, the puncture depth that is needed without injuring the bone. So lancets are specifically designed for either finger puncture or heel puncture and must have OSHA required safety features. So an important OSHA required lancet safety feature is a permanently retractable blade or needle point to reduce the risk of accidental sharp injury. So we have here the different examples of a lancet or an incision device. Then we also have a heel puncture lancet. So we have the BD Quick Heel Infant Lancet and also the Tenderfoot Toddler Lancet. We have the laser lancet. So how does it work? So several companies make devices that perforate the skin with a laser instead of a sharp instrument. So a laser typically vaporizes water in the skin to produce a small hole in the capillary bed without catheterizing delicate capillaries. Because no sharp instruments is involved, there is no need to there is no risk of accidental sharps injury and no need for sharps disposal. Okay, all you need, all you use is a laser. So an example of laser lancet is the lacet. It is a single use disposable inserts to prevent cross contamination between patients. It is cleared by the FDA for use on the fingers of adults and children five years of age and older. Use on children younger than five years old kai, is a subject to a physician's discretion. So another equipment is the micro collection containers or the micro container. Micro collection containers, also called micro tubes or micro containers, are special small plastic tubes used to collect the tiny amounts of blood obtained from capillary punctures. They are often referred to as bullets because of their size and shape. Some come fitted with narrow plastic capillary tubes to facilitate specimen collections. So, most have color-coded bodies or stoppers that correspond to color coding of the ETS blood collection tubes and markings for minimum and maximum fill levels that are typically measured in microliters or UL, such as 250 UL and 500 UL respectively. So a relatively new microtube, the BD Microtainer, has a penetrable septum for use with automated hematology systems. 
So some manufacturers print lot numbers and expiration dates on each tube. So still, still the same with the evacuated tubes. Um, lot numbers and expiration dates are still important and is on the sides of the test tube or the microtainer tube. So here are another examples. So if the top of the microtainer is rubber, meaning it can be penetrated by the hematology um, machine, but if it is not rubber, it is plastic, you have to uncap it before you process it into the hematology machine. Another equipment, we have the micro hematocrit tubes and sealants. So micro hematocrit tubes are disposable narrow bore plastic or plastic clad glass capillary tubes that fill by capillary action, take note, and typically hold 50 to 75 UL of blood. Okay, so they are used primarily for manual hematocrit, also called packed cell volume terminations. So the tubes come coated with ammonium heparin for collecting hematocrit tubes directly from a capillary puncture or plane to be used when a hematocrit tube is filled with blood from a lavender top tube. So heparin tubes typically have a red or green band on one end. Non-additive tubes have a blue band. So the plastic or clay sealants that come in small trays are used to seal one end of the microhematocrit tube. So traditionally, the dry end of the tube was inserted into the clay to plug it. So not the end where you collect the blood or the capillary blood. You have to plug the dry end of the tube. So capillary blood gas equipment. The following special equipment is used to collect capillary blood gas or the CBG specimens. So CBG collection tubes are long, thin, narrow bore capillary tubes. They are normally plastic for safety and are available in a number of different sizes to accommodate volume requirements of various testing instruments. The most common CBG tubes are the 100 mm in length with a cap capacity of 100 UL. A color-coded band identifies a type of anticoagulant that coats the inside of the tube. It is normally green, indicating sodium heparin. Okay, the buffer blood gases, you use sodium heparin as an anticoagulant. So next, capillary blood gas equipment, we have the steerers. Steerers are small metal fillings, often referred to as fleece or small metal bars. They are inserted into the tube after collection of the CBG specimen to aid in mixing the anticoagulant. So we also have the magnet. So both ends of the CBG tube are sealed immediately after specimen collection to prevent exposure to air and a magnet is used to mix the specimen. So the magnet typically has an opening in the center or side so that it can be slipped over the capillary tube and move back and forth along the tube length, pulling the metal steerer with it and mixing the anticoagulant into the blood specimen. So, diba, after collection, you put the metal steerer inside the tube and then you close the tube already immediately right after collection to prevent exposure to air and then you use the magnet and then you, you move it back and forth along the tube length outside so that the metal steerer um, metal steward inside the tube will act as a mixer to mix the anticoagulant and the blood specimen. So we also have the plastic end caps or closures. They are used to seal CBG tubes and maintain anaerobic conditions in the specimen. So CBG tubes typically come with their own caps. Another equipment, we have the glass microscope slides, occasionally used to make blood films for hematology determinations. We also have um, warming device, usually for infants. 
This increases the blood flow as much as seven times. This is especially important when performing heel sticks on newborns. Okay, so to avoid burning the patient, the device provides a uniform temperature that does not exceed 42 degrees Celsius. But what if, for example, you don't have a warming device, um, a towel or diaper dampened with warm tap water can also be used to wrap um, the hand or the foot before skin puncture. However, the care, you have to take note of how hot the water can be for us to avoid scalding the patient. So we're done with the capillary puncture equipment. Now we move on to the principles. So the composition of capillary specimen. Capillary specimen are a mixture of arterial, venous, and capillary blood along with the interstitial fluid. This is a fluid in the tissue spaces between the cells and intracellular fluid, fluid that is within the cell from the surrounding tissues. Because arterial blood enters the capillaries under pressure and capillary blood contains a higher portion of the arterial blood than venous blood, it is therefore more closely resembles the arterial blood in composition. This is essentially true if the area has been warmed because warming increases arterial flow to the area. So, because of the composition of capillary blood differs from that of the venous blood, the reference or the normal values may all also differ. So, for example, the concentration of glucose is normally higher in the capillary blood specimens, whereas the total protein, the calcium, and the potassium concentrations are usually lower, lower compared to that of the venous blood specimen. So although potassium values are normally lower in properly collected skin puncture specimens, levels may be falsely elevated if there is a tissue fluid contamination or hemolysis in the specimen. And also if you squeeze the site or the, of the skin puncture, it can falsely increase the levels of potassium. So a properly collected capillary specimen can be a practical alternative to venipuncture when small amounts of blood are acceptable for testing. So it can be an appropriate choice for adults and older children under the following circumstances. So the different indications for you to do the capillary puncture if the available veins are fragile and must be saved for other procedures such as chemotherapy. Um, several unsuccessful vent punctures have been performed and the requested test can be collected by capillary puncture. The patient has thrombotic or clot forming tendencies. The patient is apprehensive and has an intense fear of needles. There are no accessible veins. The patient has IVs in both arms and the only acceptable site are in the scarred or burnt areas. So to obtain blood for POCT procedures such as glucose monitoring. Um, capillary puncture is the preferred method of obtaining blood from infants and very young children for the following reasons. Infants have a very small blood volume. Removing quantities of blood typical for vent puncture or arterial puncture can lead to anemia. So according to studies, for every 10 ml of blood removed, as much as 4 mg of iron is also removed in infants. Large quantities removed rapidly can cause cardiac arrest. Life is, life is threatened if more than 10% of the patient's blood volume is removed at once or over a short period. So obtaining blood from infants and children's by venipuncture is also difficult and this can damage the veins and the surrounding tissues. Because infants and children, um, it's very difficult to get blood from them because they resist. And this resistance can cause them to have damaged veins and also the surrounding tissues um, near the vein or around the vein can also be damaged because the needle may, they may go on, um, pull the needle and stuff like that.
So indications, another indication it is puncturing deep veins can result to hemorrhage, venous thrombosis, infection, and gangrene. Um, infants or children can be injured by the restraining method used while performing a penipuncture. So a capillary blood is a preferred specimen for some tests, such as a newborn screening test. So, although today's technology allows many tests to be performed on very small quantities of blood and a wide selection of devices are available to make collection of skin puncture specimens relatively safe and easy, some tests can't be performed on skin puncture specimens. So, these include most erythrocyte sedimentation rate methods or the ESR methods. We also have the coagulation studies that require plasma specimens. We have the blood cultures and tests that require large volumes of serum or plasma. So the order of draw when collecting capillary puncture um, is not the same as of that in bunny puncture. Puncturing the skin releases tissue thromboplastin, which activates the coagulation process in the blood drops. So specimen must be collected quickly to minimize the effects of platelet clumping and microclot formation and to ensure that an adequate amount of specimen is collected before the site stops bleeding. So hematology specimens are collected first because they are most affected by the clotting process. So we have um, coagulation test for for the hematology section. We have the prothrombin time and then the APTT, and then we also have for CBCs, you have to collect it first for you to avoid plated clumps. So serum specimens are collected last because they are supposed to clot. The CLSI order of draw for capillary specimen is as follows. We have the blood gas specimens, the EDTA specimens, for the EDTA specimens, next we have the other additive specimens, and then the serum specimens. So we go now to the puncture steps. So capillary punctures have the same general steps regardless of whether they are finger sticks or heel sticks. The first four steps are the same as when puncture steps. 1 through 4. So first, review and accession test request. Step 2, approach, identify and prepare for the patient. Step 3, verify diet restrictions and latex sensitivity, if they are allergic to latex or not. Then step 4, sanitize hands and then put on gloves. So step 5, position the patient. Position is important to patient's comfort and the success of specimen collection. For finger punctures, the patient's arm must be supported in a firm surface with the hand extended and palm up. A young child is typically held in the lap by a patient, sorry, for by a parent or guardian who restrains the child with one arm and holds the child's arm steady with the other. For heel punctures, an infant should be so fine, lying face up with the foot lower than the torso. So the force of gravity can assist blood flow. So if you, um, if you raise the foot higher than the body, of course, the blood will not flow to the puncture site. Because of gravity, it will flow down. So it will not bleed. So the foot should be lower than the torso. Step 6, select the puncture or the incision site. General site selection criteria includes one that is warm, pink or normal color and free of scars, cuts, bruises or rashes. So it should not be cyanotic, bluish in color, edematous or swollen or infected. So, in the picture, we have an example of what a cyanotic um, palm looks like. I mean fingers. 
So you can see or you can observe the bluishness of the fingertips. So that is not um, a suitable site for the collection. Again, you should not puncture on the swollen or previously punctured sites because accumulated tissue fluid can contaminate the specimen and negatively affect their test results. Specific locations for capillary punctures include fingers of adults and heels of the infants. So in the picture, we have an example of what a, a swollen foot looks like on the left side. So adults and older children recommended site for capillary puncture older than one year is the palmar surface of the distal or end segment of the middle or the ring finger of the non-dominant hand. Okay, so I'll repeat that. For those older than one year old, it is the palmar surface of the distal or the end segment of usually the middle finger or the ring finger of the non-dominant hand. Why the non-dominant hand? Because fingers on the non-dominant hand are typically less callous. Dili siya thick because you don't use it. So, it is essentially thinner compared to those fingers on your dominant hand. So, the puncture site should be in the central fleshy portion of the finger, slightly to the side of the center, and perpendicular to the grooves in the whorls or the spiral pattern of the fingerprint. So I'll show you a picture. So you, the phlebotomist used the middle finger. So if you zoom in, the correct, the correct um, incision should be perpendicular perpendicular to the whorls of the fingerprint, not, not along the whorls because it will run along um, the creases, should we say, the creases of your fingerprint, so it will be messier. It should be perpendicular, slightly off-center, and perpendicular to the whorls of your fingerprint, okay? Okay, so we have the finger puncture precautions. So do not puncture fingers fingers of infants under the one year of age. The amount of tissue between the skin surface and bone is so small that bone injury is very likely to occur. Infection and gangrene has been identified as complications of finger punctures in newborns. Do not puncture fingers on the same side as a mastectomy without consultation with the patient's physician. The arm on the same side as a mastectomy, mastectomy sorry, is susceptible to infection and effects of lymphostasis can lead to erroneous results. Do not puncture parallel, again, to the grooves or lines of the fingerprint. A parallel puncture will allow blood to run down the finger rather than form a rounded drop and making collection difficult. So do not puncture the fifth or the little finger. The tissue between skin surface and the bone is the thinnest in this finger, and bone injury is very likely to occur. Do not puncture on the index. It is usually more calloused and harder to puncture. It is also more sensitive so that the puncture can be more painful. And because that finger is typically used more, a patient may notice the pain longer. Do not puncture the side or the very tip of the finger. The distance between the skin surface and the bone is half as much at the side and the tip as it is in the central fleshy portion. Do not puncture the thumb. It has a pulse indicating an artery and the skin is generally thicker and more callous making it difficult to obtain a good specimen. Okay, so for infants, the heel is the recommended site for collection. Infants or newborns 
less than one year of age. However, it is important to perform the puncture in an area of the heel where there is little risk of puncturing the bone. So puncture of the bone can cause painful osteomyelitis, inflammation of the bone marrow and adjacent bone or the osteochondritis, inflammation of the bone and the cartilage as a result of infection. So additional punctures through a previous puncture site that is inflamed can spread an infection. So you should never puncture the previous puncture site unless it is healed um, significantly. So take note that punctures deeper than 2 mm sa heel of the infant may cause bone damage. The vascular or the capillary bed in the skin of the newborn is located at the dermal subcutaneous junction between 0.35 and 1.6 mm beneath the skin surface. So punctures 2 mm deep or less will provide adequate blood flow without risking bone injury. So we have here a cross section of the full term infant heel showing the lancet penetration. So vascular bed should be 0.35 mm to 0.82 mm in depth, rich in capillary loops already. But if you puncture more than 2 mm, so below this, Below this, 2 mm is already the bone. So if you puncture more than that, you will cause bone injury. Sa mga newborn. Okay? So according to the CLSI, uh, to avoid puncturing bone, the only safe areas for heel puncture are on the plantar surface of the heel the medial to an imaginary line extending from the middle of the great toe um, to the heel or the lateral to an imaginary line extending from between the fourth and the fifth toes of the heel. Punctures in other areas risk bone, nerve, tendon, and cartilage injury. So again, safe areas are the plantar surface, medial to an imaginary line extending from the middle of the great toe or lateral to an imaginary line extending from between the fourth and the fifth toes of the heel. So, I'll show you an example. So, we have the middle, middle of the great toe. So, you um, imagine a line and then another is for the fifth so middle of the fifth toe and then they should be then perpendicular so you will get the shaded areas represent the recommended safe areas for heel puncture so technically the side of the heel okay so next we have the heel puncture precautions First, do not puncture any deeper than 2 mm thick. Deeper punctures risk injuring the bone, even in the safest puncture areas. Do not puncture areas between the imaginary boundaries. The calcaneus may be as little as 2 mm deep in this area. Do not puncture in the R and any areas of the foot other than the heel. Arteries, nerves, tendons, and cartilages in these areas can be injured. Do not puncture severely bruised areas. It is painful and impaired circulation or byproducts of the healing process can negatively affect the specimen. Do not puncture the posterior curvature of the heel. The bone can be as little as 1 mm deep in this area. Do not puncture through previous puncture sites. This can be painful and can spread previously undetected, undetected infection. Do not puncture a site that is swollen. Excess tissue fluid in the area could contaminate the specimen. Okay, so step eight, you should clean and air dry the site. The collection site must be cleaned with an antiseptic before puncture. 
so that skin flora, the microorganisms on the skin, do not infiltrate the puncture wound and cause an infection. The CLSI recommended antiseptic for cleaning a capillary puncture site is a 70% isopropanol. Take note of that. So after cleaning, allow the site to air dry to ensure maximum antiseptic action and minimize the chance of alcohol contamination of the specimen. Residual alcohol, in addition to causing a stinging sensation, causes rapid hemolysis of red blood cells. It has also been shown to interfere with glucose testing. So make sure na before puncturing, make sure that the alcohol is completely dried up. So select collection devices according to the tests that have been ordered and place them within easy reach along with separate layers of gauze or gauze type pads. Select a new sterile lancet incision device according to the site selected, age of the patient, and amount of blood to be collected. So prepare equipment in view of the patient or guardian to provide assurance that it is new and being handled aseptically. So key point here is preparing the equipment in view of the patient or the guardian. Okay, some in, the, in a laboratory setting, um, if they don't see that you're using or you opened a new syringe or a new lancet, they will ask you, is it new or is it reused? Of course, we know that that's, um, material should never be reused in the laboratory, but for their um. For assurance sake, you have to show that you're opening a new um, equipment in front of the patient or the guardian for them to be assured that it is new. So verify Lancet sterility by checking to see that the packaging is intact before opening. Open the package or protective cover in an aseptic manner and do not allow the device opening to rest or brush against any non-sterile surface. If the lancet or the incision device has protective shield or locking feature that prevents accidental activation, remove or release it per manufacturer's instructions. Hold the device between the thumb and the index finger as described by the manufacturer. Okay, so step 10, you puncture the site and discard the lancet. So for finger puncture, you grasp the patient's finger between your non-dominant hand, dominant thumb, and index finger. Hold it securely in case of sudden movement, then place the lancet device flat against the skin in the central fleshy pad of the finger, slightly to the side of the center and then perpendicular again to the fingerprint whorls as described in the sub-6. So, if you're holding a toddler's finger, you should hold at least three fingers, but you puncture only one. For this, is, this provides more stability in your grip. So, for heel puncture, grasp the foot Gently but firmly with your non-dominant hand, encircle the heel by wrapping your index finger around the arch and your thumb around the bottom. So wrap the other fingers around the foot, around the top of the foot, and then place the lancet flat against the skin on the medial or lateral plantar surface of the heel. So follow manufacturer's instructions for direction of puncture. So step 11. Wipe away the first blood drop. This is very important. So the first drop is typically contaminated with ex excess tissue fluid and may contain alcohol residue that can hemolyze the specimen and also keep the blood from forming a well-rounded drop. In addition, there have been reports of isopropyl alcohol contamination causing errors in blood glucose testing. So it is very important for you to wipe away the first drop of blood. Position the site downward and apply gentle pressure toward the site to encourage blood flow, but not too tight that can it can cause the false increase of potassium. Wipe away the first blood of, drop of blood using a dry gauze pad. So step 12, 
filled and mix the tubes or the containers in the order of draw. Okay. So continue to position the site downward to enhance blood flow and apply gentle intermittent pressure to tissue surrounding a heel puncture site or the proximal to a finger puncture site. So collect subsequent blood drops using devices appropriate for the ordered test. So to fill a collection tube or device, touch it to the drop of the blood formed on the surface of the skin. If making a blood film, touch the appropriate area of the slide to the blood drop. Never on the skin, but on the blood formed on the surface of the skin. So you may need to tap the microtubes gently now and then to encourage the blood to settle at the bottom. Okay, if you don't tap it, they will settle on the side. So when filled to an appropriate level, seal the containers with the covers provided. Mix the additive by gently inverting them. 8 to 10 times or per manufacturer's instructions. If blood flow stops and you're unable to collect sufficient specimen, the procedure may be repeated at the new site with a new lancet. So after collecting specimens, apply pressure to the site with a clean gauze pad until the bleeding stops. Keep the site elevated while applying pressure. Um, an infant's foot should be elevated above the body while pressure is applied. All of this to stop the bleeding process immediately. So step 14, label specimens and observe special handling instructions. Step 15, check the site and then apply the bandage. The site must be examined to verify that the bleeding has stopped. If bleeding persists beyond 5 minutes, notify the patient's nurse or the patient's physician. If bleeding has stopped and the patient is an older child or adult, apply a bandage and advise the patient to keep it in place for at least 15 minutes to avoid infection. So step 16, dispose of used and contaminated materials, equipment, packaging, and bandage wrappers are normally discarded in the regular trash. Some facilities require contaminated items, such out, same with our facility, such as the blood-soaked gauze to be discarded in the biohazard containers. Follow facility protocol. Again, you should dispose your used materials properly, especially in our laboratory class. So step 17, you should thank the patient, remove gloves, and then sanitize hands. So a lot of you forgot to thank your patient in your venipuncture proficiency syringe method. So you always have to thank the patient after the procedure. Okay, step 18, transport specimen to the lab. Prompt delivery to the lab protects specimen integrity and is typically achieved by personal delivery, transportation via a pneumatic tube system or a courier device. So in the NCDU H or Cebu Doctors University Hospital, we're the one um, who transports the blood so via personal delivery. But in other hospitals like the Perpetual, they have a transport device, um, they have the pneumatic tube system. Okay. So we have here a tabular form for the finger stick procedure. We have the steps and also the additional explanation and additional notes in regards to that step. So step one to three is for the ID of the patient, dietary restrictions. <clears throat> step four, sanitize the hands. 5. Position the patient. 6. Select the puncture or the incision site. Okay, so 7. Warm the site, if applicable, using the warming device as I've discussed earlier. Or if you don't have a warming device, you use a um, washcloth with warm, soaked in warm water. So 8. Clean and air dry the site. So 9. Prepared equipment. 10. Puncture the site and discard the lancet or the incision device properly. 
Then grasp the patient's finger between your non-dominant hand. 11. You should always wipe away the first blood drop. And then 12. Fill and mix the tubes or the containers in the order of draw. 13. Place gauze and apply pressure. 14. Label the specimens and observe special handling instructions. 15. Check the site again if there is still bleeding and then apply the bandage. 16. Dispose of used and contaminated materials. 17. Take the patient, remove the gloves and sanitize the hands. 18. Then transport the specimen to the lab. Same with the heel stick procedure. You have the steps and also the explanation in a tabular form. So steps 1 to 3 again. Same with the finger stick procedure. 4. Sanitize hands. 5. Position the patient. 6. Select the puncture or incision. For the puncture and incision site of the heel stick, again, on the medial or the lateral plantar surface of the heel, that is warm, normal color, free of cuts, bruises, infection, rashes, swelling, or previous punctures. Okay. 7. Warm the site. Again, with using the warming device or comfortably warm washcloth. 8. Clean and air dry the site. Okay, so 9. Prepare the equipment. 10. Puncture the site and discard the lancet. Incision. 11. So, wipe away the first blood drop. And then take note of the picture on how the phlebotomist holds the heel or the foot of the baby. Okay. The 12. Fill and mix tubes and containers in order of draw. Place the gauze and apply pressure. 14. Label the specimen and observe special handling instructions. 15. Check the site again for any bleeding. Again, take note, beyond 5 minutes of bleeding, you should notify the patient's nurse or the physician. Okay, so 16, dispose of used material and contaminated materials. 17, you should thank the parent or the guardian. Of course, if you're doing the heel stick procedure, meaning the patient is less than 1 year old. So, if the parent or the guardian is present, if you're not in the nursery, you should thank the parents. Remove gloves and then sanitize hands. 18. Transport specimen to the lab. Okay, so we're done with the finger, finger stick procedure and also the heel stick procedure. Now we go to the special capillary puncture procedures. So first, special capillary procedure is for capillary blood gases. Capillary puncture blood is less desirable for blood gas analysis primarily because of its partial arterial composition and also because it is temporarily exposed to air during collection. This can alter the test results. Consequently, capillary blood gas specimens are rarely collected in adults. However, because arterial punctures can be hazardous to infants and young children, blood gas analysis on these patients is sometimes performed on capillary specimens. Okay, so blood gas specimens are collected from the same site as routine capillary puncture specimens. Warming the site using a warming device or a warm towel for 5 to 10 minutes before collection is necessary to increase blood flow and arterialize the specimen. Proper collection technique is essential to minim minimize exposure of the specimen to air. Okay, so we have here the collection of a capillary blood gas specimen by heel puncture. So, steps 1 to 6 are the same with the routine heel stick procedure. 7. You warm the site for 3 to 5 minutes or for 5 to 10 minutes. Number 8. Clean and air dry the site again. Then 9. Prepare the equipment. 10. Puncture the site and discard the lancet. 
11. Wipe away the first drop of blood. 12. Fill the capillary tube with blood. Then immediately cap both ends of the tube. 14. As we discussed earlier, you mix the specimen using the magnet. Okay, so run the magnet back and forth for the full length of the tube several times. The magnet pulls the metal stirrer or the fleece with it, mixing the blood with the heparin and preventing clotting. But as I discussed earlier, after you collect the specimen or the blood in the tube, you put the metal stirrer inside the tube so that when you use your magnet, the metal stirrer will be the one to mix the blood with the heparin. So you mix the specimen using the magnet. You never, you don't invert the tube when you use um, in the capillary blood gas procedure. So 15, label the tube. 16, place the tube in ice slurry. Place the tube horizontally in ice slurry. Cooling slows WBC metabolism and prevents changes in the pH and blood gas values. Okay, so 17, check the puncture site. Again, bleeding beyond 5 minutes, you should notify the nurse or the physician. 18, dispose of used and contaminated materials. 19, thank the parent or a guardian, remove the gloves and sanitize hands. And 20, transport specimen to the lab. Okay, so we're done with... Um, arterial blood gas collection in the capillary puncture. Now we have the neonatal bilirubin collection. So neonates or the newborns are commonly tested to detect and monitor increased bilirubin levels caused by overproduction or impaired excretion of the bilirubin. So overproduction of bilirubin occurs from accelerated red blood cell hemolysis associated with hemolytic disease of the newborn while impaired bilirubin excretion often results from temporary abnormal liver function, commonly associated with premature infants. So high levels of bilirubin will result in jaundice or the yellow skin color of the baby. Okay, so bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier in infants, accumulating to toxic levels that can cause permanent brain damage or even death. That is why it's very important to monitor the bilirubin levels of a newborn. A transfusion may be needed if levels increase at a rate equal to or greater than 5 mg per dl per hour or when levels exceed 18 mg per dl. Take note that bilirubin breaks down in the presence of light. Consequently, jaundiced infants are often placed under the special ultraviolet or UV lights to lower the bilirubin levels. Okay, so bilirubin specimens are normally collected by heel puncture. Proper collection procedure is crucial to the accuracy of results. Specimen must be collected quickly to minimize exposure to light. Um, in your arterial blood gas, you have to collect quickly for you to minimize exposure to air, while in the bilirubin, you have to work quickly for the sample to have minimal exposure to light. Okay? and must be protected from light during transportation and handling. So we have here an example of an amber-colored microcollection container. This is used to protect a bilirubin specimen from effects of the ultraviolet light. So usually, our microtainers are clear-colored or colorless, while in your bilirubin sample, it must be inside an amber-colored microcollection container. But if this is not available, you can use the carbon paper or any paper and then you wrap it around the tube or the microtainer for it to prevent exposure to sunlight or ultraviolet light. Next process or next special procedure, we have the newborn or neonatal screening. So it, the state, it is a state-mandated testing of newborns for the presence of certain genetic or inherited 
metabolic or chemical changes, hormonal and functional disorders that can cause severe mental handicaps or other serious abnormalities if not detected and treated early. So some states also screen for infectious agents such as toxoplasma and HIV. So the number and type of newborn screening tests varies by state. Requirements for disorders to be included in the newborn screening panel include benefits to early diagnosis, availability of accurate tests to confirm diagnosis, and better health as a result of early detection and treatment. So most newborn or neonatal screening are ideally performed when an infant is between 24 to 72 hours old, so 1 to 3 days old. Take note. Because of early hospital release, some infants are tested before they are 24 hours. Early testing for some tests, like the, your phenylketonuria or PKU, may not give accurate results, so some states require repeat testing approximately two weeks later. Specimens for newborn screening tests are collected by heel puncture and require a special state form. So figure 1013 is an example of a newborn screening specimen collection equipment. So how do you collect for newborn screening? We have the blood spot collection. Newborn screening tests except Hearing tests are typically performed in a few drops of blood obtained by heel puncture. So the blood drops are collected by absorption onto circles printed on the special type of filter paper that is typically part of the NBS form. The blood-filled circles are often referred to as blood spots. As many as 30 different disorders can be detected in the blood spots on one form. So figure 1014 is an example of a newborn screening form with collection circles displayed. So as you can observe in the picture, on your right side of the paper, you have the circles. This is where you will um, let the blood drop for it to be filled. Okay. To fill the circles, heel puncture is performed and the first blood drop is wiped away in the normal manner. So the filter paper is brought close to the heel. You should never allow it to touch the heel. And a large drop of free flowing blood is applied to the center of the, circle, of the first circle on the printed side of the paper. The paper must not be allowed to touch the surface of the heel. Okay, this can result in smearing, blotting, and stoppage of blood flow and incomplete penetration of the blood through the paper. So, so the same process is continued until all circles are filled. Unfilled or incompletely filled circles can result in inability to perform all required tasks. Circles must be filled from one side of the paper only and by one large drop that spreads throughout the circle. So application of multiple drops or filling circles from both sides of the paper causes layering of the blood and possible misinterpretation of results. So when you apply the drops, you should start from one side and then going to the other, not, um, not the alternate circles. You should always start, if you want to start from the left side, you start from the left side up until you go to the right side. Okay. So after collection, the specimen must be allowed to air dry in an elevated horizontal position away from heat or sunlight. Specimens should not be hung to dry or stacked together before, during, or after the drying process. Hanging may cause the blood to migrate and concentrate toward the low end and lead to erroneous test results. While stacking can result in cross-contamination between specimens which also causes erroneous results. So when dried, the requisition containing the sample is normally placed in a special envelope and sent to a state, public health laboratory, or other approved laboratory for testing. Results are sent to the infant's physician or other healthcare provider. So we have the summer 
characterization in a tabular form. So we have the steps and explanation. So for chap uh, for steps one to four, follow the venipuncture step. Then five, position the patient. Again, you should just check the heel stick procedure for it's the same. So now we go to um, step 12, bring the filter paper close to the heel. Then step 13, generate a large free-flowing drop of blood. 14, touch the blood drop to the center of the filter paper. Then 15, fill the circle with blood. Then 16, fill the remaining blood spot circles. Seventeen, place the gauze and apply the pressure. Eighteen, label. Nineteen, check the site. Again, for five minutes. Twenty, dispose of used materials. Twenty-one, allow the specimen to air dry. Then twenty-two, dispatch the specimen to a testing facility. Okay, so another special test is for the, your Another special procedure, it is not a test, um, routine blood film or smear preparation. This is for your hematology department. So a blood film or smear, it is a drop of blood that is spread thin on a microscope slide. This is required to perform a manual differential count. Um, this is a test in which the number, type, and characteristic of blood cells are determined by examining a stained blood smear under a microscope. Okay, so a manual differential may be performed as part of the CBC or the complete blood count or to confirm abnormal results of a machine-generated differential or platelet count. Okay, so two blood smears are normally prepared and submitted for testing. Although a common practice in the past, today blood smears are rarely made at the bedside. They are typically made in the hematology department from blood collected in an EDTA or the EDTA tube, either by hand or using an automatic, automated machine that makes a uniform smear from a single drop of blood. Okay. Okay, so a few special tests require evaluation of a blood smear made from a fresh drop of blood from a fingertip. So skin puncture collection of peripheral blood smears is typically performed, preferred. Sorry. When collected with other skin puncture specimens, blood smears should be collected first to avoid effects of the platelet clumping. Take note that uh, if there are a lot of tests and um, it also has a blood smear, you should always do the blood smear first before the other tests for you to avoid platelet clumps. Okay. Okay, so we have the tabular form of the prepara preparation of blood smear from a capillary puncture. Again, you can do a blood smear bedside or like inside the patient's room using the capillary puncture the steps here but you can also do your blood smear inside the laboratory using the already collected EDTA tube specimen okay so these are the steps for the bedside blood smear so first perform the capillary puncture second wipe away again the first blood drop then third, you touch the slide next. You touch the slide to the next blood drop. Okay. So, based on the picture, you should notice that the phlebotomist touched the blood drop one half to an inch from one end of a plain slide. So, not in the middle. You should put it um, one half to one inch from the end of the plane slide near the end or adjacent to the frosted end okay 
So number four, you hold the blood drop slide between the thumb and the fourth finger of the non-dominant hand. With the other hand, rest the second slide in front of the drop at an angle of approximately 30 degrees. So the second slide is called the pusher or the spreader slide. Take note of that. And it is held at one end. Okay. If the blood is of normal thickness, a 30 degree angle will create a smear that covers approximately three fourths of the remaining area of the slide. So if you have a blood drop that is thin, you have to, of course, lower your angle of the spreader slide. And if it is too thick, you have to increase the angle of your spreader slide. So step five, pull the spreader slide back to the edge, then stop it as soon as it touches the drop and allow the, the blood to spread along its width. So once, you, once the spreader slide touches the blood, you have to wait until it spreads out, like in the picture. Okay, so step six, push the spreader slide away from the drop in one smooth motion. You have to do this fast, carrying it the entire length and off the end of the blood drop slide. So let the weight of the spreader slide carry the blood and create the film or the smear. Do not push down on the spreader slide because this creates lines and ridges and it is not an acceptable blood film. Okay. So you have to apply pressure, but not too much pressure. Okay. Seven, place a drop of blood for the second smear. On the spreader slide, use the slide with the first smear as the spreader slide for the second smear and make it the same manner as the first one. Okay. Number eight, place the gauze. Again, ask the patient to apply pressure. 9. Label the frosted blood slides. You should always label the slides. If you're using a pre-printed label, attach it to the over the writing or in the empty space uh, if it is in a plain slide. Okay, so number 10. Allow the blood films to air dry. And then 11, thank the patient, remove the gloves, sanitize hands, and then 12, transport the specimen to the lab. So an example of an automatic blood drop, blood dropper. So we have a diff safe blood drop delivery service, letter B, U, the picture is shown applying a blood drop to a slide using the diff safe device and then letter C, the blood drop on the slide. So that is the nor that's, that's supposed to be the normal blood drop. So it's not too thick and it's not too thin. Caution, blood smears are considered biohazardous or infectious until they are stained or fixed. So even if they are already smeared in the slide, it is still hazardous. So making a good blood smear is a skill that takes practice to perfect. Yes, I can attest to this because even if you're already in the laboratory, it takes time to make a perfect blood smear. Improperly made blood smears may not contain a normal, even distribution of blood cells and can produce erroneous results. An acceptable smear covers about one half to three fourths of the surface of the slide and has no holes, no lines, or jagged edges. It should show a smooth transition from thick to thin when held up into the light. The thinnest area of the properly made smear, often referred to as the feather, is one cell thick, and it is the most important area because that is where a differential is performed. Okay, so smears that are uneven, too long, too short, too thick, or too thin are not acceptable. The length and thickness of the smear can usually be controlled by adjusting the size of the drop or the angle of the spreader slide. Dirt, fingerprints, or powder on the slide, or fat globules and lipids in the specimen can result in holes in the smear. A chip pusher slide, a blood drop that has started to dry out, 
or uneven pressure as the smear is made can cause can cause the smear to have dragged edges. Okay, so we have the list here. So we have the list of problems and then the probable cause. You should um, take note on this one. So absence of the feather, spreader slide lifted before the smear was completed, holes in the smear, dirty slide, fat globules, blood contaminated with glove powder, bridges or uneven thickness, too much pressure applied to the spreader slide, smear is too thick, blood drop too large, spreader slide angle too steep or too high, patient has high red blood cell count. Smear is too short, blood drop too small, spreader slide angle too steep, or too high again, yeah. Spreader slide push too quickly, patient has high red blood cell count. Smear is too long, blood drop too large, or spreader slide angle too shallow or too low, spreader slide push too slowly, patient has a low hemoglobin. Smear is too thin, blood drop too small, spreader slide angle too shallow or too low, patient has a low hemoglobin. So streaks or tails in the feathered edge, blood drops started to dry up. That's why you have to work fast when you do blood smears. Edge of the spreader slide is dirty or chip. Spreader slide push through blood drop. Uneven pressure applied to the spreader slide. Okay, so we have the thick, thick blood smear preparation. Thick blood smears are often requested to detect the presence of malaria. A disorder caused by four species of the parasitic porozoan organisms called the plasmodia. So these organisms are transmitted to humans by the bite of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. Symptoms of malaria include serial bouts of fever and chills at regular intervals related to the multiplication of certain forms of the organism within the red blood cells and the consequent rupture of those cells. So the progressive destruction of red blood cells in certain types of malaria can cause, can let it cause severe anemia. Okay, so malaria is diagnosed with the presence of the organism in a peripheral blood smear. So diagnosis often requires the evaluation of the both regular and the thick blood smears. So presence of the organism is observed most frequently in a thick smear. However, identification of the species requires evaluation of a regular blood smear. So malaria smears may be ordered stat or at timed intervals and are most commonly collected just before the onset of the fever and chills. Okay, so how do you prepare a thick blood smear preparation? So a very large drop of blood is placed in the center of the glass slide or if you have the thick and thin, you drop it at the one end of the slide, like in the picture. So you use the corner of another slide or a cover slip, and then you spread it out in a circular motion until it is the size of a dime. So all you have to do is you spread out the drop of blood until it is the size of a dime. So can you can observe here the thick film it is circular and then the drop of blood is just spread out so this smear is allowed to dry for a minimum of two hours before staining with fresh diluted jumps of stain it is a water-based stain that lyses the red blood cell lyses means ruptures and makes the organism easier to see okay so Okay, so I guess that's it. Thank you for listening, everyone.